morning, everybody, and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. We are so glad to have each of you here with us as we prepare to worship. If you are new to our church, we do have a visitor table. It's out in the lobby. We would love to meet you there after the service. Uh, before we get started today, we do have a special announcement. Um, as many of you know, our dear Pat Wallenberger um, recently was hospitalized and is um, enduring some intensive rehab right now um, after her surgery. She was one of our main leaders for our Sunday morning fellowship team, which provides the snacks each week after the service. And so we are looking for some volunteers to help um, cover the extra uh, spots we have for people serving with her being in rehab and we've had a few other members who have uh, moved away that used to serve on the team. Um, we're looking for quite a few individuals who could help and serve those snacks. Um, it's a ministry that's really important to a lot of us here. I know my children really enjoy uh, rushing back there after the service for treats, but it helps just provide a nice warm atmosphere for our church to fellowship after the service. And so if you are interested in serving in this capacity, we would just invite you to check in with Mary Alice after the service and she can give you more information. All right, we do have a few groups that are meeting this week. First, our Ladies Never Alone group is meeting today right after the service in the conference room. Um, and so if you need information about that, you can see Terry Mott after the service. Then on Thursday, our high mileage group will be meeting at 12 p.m. also here at the church in the conference room. And then finally, our men's group will be meeting Thursday night at 7 p.m. Again, in the conference room. Should be easy to remember. All right, that's all I have for today. So I'm going to pass it off to Tyler, who will lead us in the liturgy. Good morning, Westminster. Uh, as Stacy said, my name is Tyler. I'm the director of ministries here. Um, welcome to you, and welcome also if you're streaming. Um, we here at Westminster... Um, we seek to be people who are obsessed with the gospel. Our mission is to make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ, and we believe that in Christ we have not only eternal life, but abundant life now as well. But maybe your week didn't feel like abundant life. Maybe you enter now feeling weary or you feel hesitant to draw near to God. The good news is that we don't come to worship resting on our own merit or how well we performed this week. But instead, we rest truly on the work of Christ on our behalf alone. He is both the reason for our worship and the reason our worship is acceptable. So, if you're weary, come to Jesus. Seek in him what you can't find within yourself, no matter how hard you look. And let that be your reason for joy in worship this morning. Let me open us in prayer. God of all grace, we Revel in the fact that you love humans enough that you uh, will do anything to bring us to yourselves, bring us to yourself. And we thank you that you have uh, been willing to sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf, that in his death, that division between man and God has been broken down forever. Help us to trust in him, to come to you with boldness and resting in his merit alone. We pray this in his name. Amen. My name is Jonathan, and every few weeks here at Westminster, we sing a new song. And this morning, we're going to sing a new song written by Edmund Clowney, kind of a hero of my wife and I, and he sought to show us Jesus throughout scripture and actually throughout our lives and the words to the song this morning who shall ascend the mountain of the lord do just that but before that we're going to have a call to worship so please stand i'll begin have mercy on us O lord for we call to you all day long together bring joy to your servants for to you, O Lord, we lift up our souls. Among the gods, there is none like you. There is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. For you alone are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. You, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger 
abounding in love and faithfulness. We will praise you, O Lord our God. With all our hearts, we will glorify your name forever. Let's sing. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord to search the mystery in heaven's store? The together. Dear Father, we thank you that your Son, the framer of the worlds, came to die for us. We needed him to do so, to lift us up to you, to make us able to come, be able to come to you. We thank you that Jesus, our great high priest, is also our Savior. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
Turn to someone and say good morning. Okay, if we could please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from the New Testament since uh, Dr. Phil Riken is going to be preaching for us from our Ecclesiastes series. So our New Testament reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of, the, of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory, glory be to the Father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. come to our confession of sin and part of being gospel-centered people is that we must acknowledge the uncomfortable fact that we are sinful and in constant need of grace but the gospel isn't really I'm a nice person it is I'm a sinful and selfish and broken person but God loved me so much that he was willing to sacrifice his son so that he could be with me that's how bad I am but that is also how awesome God is that's an intense thought, but the kind of, that kind of love alone can free us up to be honest about ourselves. So, let us confess our sins using these words together. 
Please read with me. Father, you have called us to follow you and live countercultural lives. You have called us to let you shape our dreams, our goals, our desires, and our hearts. However, we come to you this morning confessing that we have allowed our world to shape us instead of you. Where you desire us to serve, we have sought to be served. Where you desire us to sacrifice, we have pursued comfort. Where you have sought us to engage, we have remained aloof. Where you have sought us as your children, we have lived as orphans. Now, Father, accept our confession and receive us gladly. We ask this not upon our deserving it or even the honesty of our confession, but for the sake of Jesus. You rejected him, the innocent, in order to embrace us, the guilty. Amen. Hear now, O Lord, our silent prayers of confession. For your constant grace, O Lord, we give thanks through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now the assurance of pardon from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please stand for our song of thanksgiving. standing for our confession of faith and we're continuing our confession of faith from the Westminster Shorter Catechism with question 11. So church, what are God's works of providence? 
God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. Please be seated. We are going to continue with an offering. Uh, there's a basket in the back and there's also ways that you can see to give on the screen. We're gonna continue singing How Firm a Foundation. Saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, for be not this faith. For I am the God and will still give thee way. How strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand. Honored by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you in troubles to blast and sanctify to you your deepest distress. The soul that on Jesus has been fully opposed I will not, I will not desert to his foes. Thy soul, though my heart should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Good morning. My name is Robin Cho. I serve as a pastor here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Welcome. Uh, welcome for, uh, we're so glad that you can come in person, but also a special welcome to those joining us on the live stream. Well, before we go to prayer, I'd love to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Phil Riken. He's not a stranger to WBC, but since so many of you are newer, allow me to grant you a short bio of Dr. Riken. Dr. Riken is the eighth president of Wheaton College. He graduated from Wheaton College. Uh, Dr. Riken earned a Master of Divinity degree from Westminster Theological Seminary, and then also a doctorate in historical theology from the University of Oxford. He was then the senior minister of Philadelphia's historic 10th Presbyterian Church before transitioning to his presidency at Wheaton in 2000. And 10. He is married to Lisa, who is here with us today. They have five children and one grandchild. Dr. Riken has published more than 50 books, and you can check out some of them at our library in the conference room, just directly next to the front doors. Dr. Riken has been an inspiring mentor, friend, confidant, and godly model to me for now over 13 years. I'm so glad for his friendship and so glad. Phil, that you're here with us today. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for graciously inviting us into your presence today. You not only invite us, but you sustain us and keep us. This is all made possible because of your grace and because of the finished work of your Son, Jesus the Christ. You are the all-powerful creator of the universe, yet you condescend to your people mercifully and remind us that we have this personal relationship with you almighty God as our meditation verse this morning states in Psalm 8 when I look at your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have set in place what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him amaze us yet again Heavenly Father 
as you remind us of the eternal truths that we revere and want to uphold. Father, we lift up some of our members now that are struggling. We seek out your compassion and mercy for those that are hurting, doubting, and experiencing the dark night of the soul. We ask for comfort, O Lord. For those that are physically ailing, we ask for healing. For Phyllis Edmondson and her recent bout with pneumonia, but then also her broken femur in a fall last week. Most of us can't imagine, oh God, what that must feel like or be like, and we ask that you would relieve her of intense pain as she awaits for her doctor's plan for recovery. Please be near to her, O oh Lord. We also pray for our dear sister Pat. We ask that you comfort her as she awaits the pathology report after her brain surgery, for strength during her intense rehab at St. Joe's, for spiritual sustenance as she clings to your comforting promises. Increase her faith, O oh Lord, in this intense trial. We pray for many here who have not been able to share some of their deep, uh, deeper struggles that they have been burdened with, sometimes excruciating pain from trials and sufferings. Help us be a church body, O oh Lord, that seeks to carry one another's burdens and extend Christ-like and Christ-centered love to one another. But we earnestly pray for your grace to overwhelm the souls of those overwhelmed with life's troubles. Father, we pray for things happening in our world. We continue to pray for those suffering in the Gaza conflict and too much pain and loss of life to even comprehend. We admit readily, O oh Lord, that we don't understand these things. We are finite, we are lacking. We sometimes don't even know how to pray for things like this. But we ask that you help us through your spirit to pray for those who are grieving and immensely anguished, filled with sorrow and pain. We ask for mercy over this situation. In the midst of darkness and pain, we pray that somehow the light of you, almighty God, would shine through, through the ministry of your son, Jesus, through local churches, through the church global. We pray for boldness, courage, and strength as we seek to minister to the weary hearted. Father, we thank you for Dr. Riken and his influential and faithful work at Wheaton College. We pray that you would increase the fruit that we have already seen. We pray for protection for your faithful servant and worker, not only for him, but for his whole family, for his colleagues and co-laborers. May they point students and in turn the world to the beauty of Christ and his good news. We pray that you use him even today as he proclaims the powerful word of you, O oh God, to our hearts and souls. May our hearts and minds be eagerly attentive to the things of you, O oh God. We pray this in Jesus' merciful name. Amen. If you are four years old, all the way up through fifth grade, you are now dismissed to Children's Church, and the rest of us, please stand as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings fall. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of Scripture. We'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. It's good to be at Westminster Presbyterian Church, and uh, which is really a home away from home for us. Um, I love you, Robin, and your ministry. It's good to be with you this morning and grateful for this invitation, although this may be the most discouraging passage in a very discouraging book. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 8, beginning at verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all. 
how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, you have embarked on a journey through the book of Ecclesiastes, which I would recommend to anyone. And you've followed along as the preacher king, the Solomon of Ecclesiastes, goes on his quest to discover the meaning of life. The quest does not end the way that you might have expected. Usually when people try to figure something out, they hope to come up with a simple, unambiguous answer. And if you're trying to figure out something about the meaning of life, you want something that you can put on a poster or hang on your bedroom wall. And we got really close to that in chapter 8, verse 15. Maybe this is the way things ended a week ago. I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. After everything we've been through in Ecclesiastes, if we had ended there, we would have taken it. Good enough. That's enough of an understanding of life. I can try to pursue joy in this life that God gives me. But this preacher king kept wrestling and struggling with what he was seeing in his own life and seeing around him. And the more he looked into things, the more he seemed to struggle to make sense of his world. And it's discouraging. A friend this week introduced me to the poetry of Michelangelo. Maybe you didn't know that Michelangelo was a poet. I didn't know that. You would think that Michelangelo, with all the success that he had achieved and everything that he was able to portray about the story of salvation, surely he would have come to a place of some contentment in life. But Michelangelo wrote, everything ends that begins, all things around us perish, for time is fleeting and the sun sees that all things around us perish, thought, speech, pain and rapture, and our children's children vanished as shadows by day, as mists in a breeze. What book do you suppose Michelangelo was reading from the Bible when he wrote those words? He was struggling with the same things that we see in the world around us. I imagine that both Michelangelo and Solomon would have sympathized with the frustration that the venerable Samuel Johnson experienced when he came to the end of his famous dictionary. He wrote a dictionary with a definition for every word that he could find anywhere in the English-speaking world. But when he came to the end of that process and was ready to publish, he did not think for a moment that he had figured it all out. He said in his preface, I saw that one inquiry only gave occasion to another, that one book referred to another book, that to search was not always to find, and to find was not always to be informed. And thus, to chase perfection was to chase the sun. And so it was for the preacher king of Ecclesiastes. Maybe that's why you enjoy the book. 
because you say, finally, here's something that's honest about the struggles of life in a fallen and often frustrating world. This is not the kind of book, spoiler alert, that you keep reading until you reach the end and then you get a tidy answer. It's not like a mystery where everything gets solved. It's a book where you keep struggling with the problems of life and as you struggle, hopefully you learn this, to trust God with the questions even when you don't have all the answers. And that's how the Christian life works. It is not only about what you get at the end, but it's about who you become along the way and who you discover God to be. This morning, if you're still struggling to find the answers, here is hope to live by while you are waiting to find them. Let's take a closer look at these verses, 816 to 96. First, the philosopher's frustration. We're here at the end of Ecclesiastes 8, and the preacher king is still struggling. Notice this philosopher's frustration. He seemed to have come to a point of resolution in verse 15, but in verse six, verses 16 and 17, he, he can't figure it all out. He says, even if you really struggle and you seek, you won't be able to find it, find it out. And by this point, if there's one thing we know about the preacher king, we know that he's going to be totally honest with us about the frustrations that he sees in life, both by careful, by, by careful observation of the world around him, also by his own personal experience. He has tried to discover the way things are, and all he has figured out so far is that life is a weary business, and it's hard to know for sure what God is even doing in the world. And if somebody tries to tell you something different than that, if they claim to have figured things out, if they say that they are wise and understand the secret plans of God, they are not telling you the full truth. And the more this man tried to figure things out, the more anxious he became. You get the sense in verses, in verse 17, 16, verses 16 and 17 that he's having trouble sleeping. And his testimony about his insomnia gives us the truth about our own restless days and sleepless nights. We're so busy that we never seem to get the rest that we need. Ask uh, most faculty and staff and students at Wheaton College how they are doing, and they'll tell you, I feel really tired, that's what they'll say. And maybe you feel the same way. I sometimes dream, in fact, I'm a public advocate for this, about getting a Gruns Day, that day tucked between Wednesday and Thursday, an extra 24 hours to get everything done. And nobody can take any appointments. They can't send you any emails. The truth is that if God gave us eight days, of, eight days a week, we'd try to cram nine days of effort into those eight days. This is the toil. We never seem to get enough rest. And one of the weariest things of all is trying to understand the work of God. No matter how wise we are, no matter how much we toil in seeking, we fail to comprehend his holy ways. So many things in the divine government of the universe are beyond our capacity to know. People these days are talking about the possibilities of artificial intelligence, everything that you can get chat GPT to figure out for you. It's not going to take you any closer to the mysteries of life. So what is the best way for us to respond? Some people look at the confusion in the world, they conclude there is no God. Others, that there may be a God, but if there is, he really doesn't know what he is doing. This is the point that the, that Thomas, the poet Thomas Hardy reached in describing it the deity of the universe as a dark, dumb thing that turns the handle of this idol show. God doesn't know what he's doing either. The preacher king doesn't give in to that kind of thinking. He's skeptical about his ability to know the mind of God, but notice in verse 17, he believes that what happens in the world is all the work of God. And if we're wise, we'll admit there are mysteries about life we don't understand, but we won't doubt the existence of God or decide that he is limited in his understanding. In fact, in our uh, in our catechetical reading this morning, what we have confessed through the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it's a testimony that God is a sovereign God, that he governs all thoughts and all actions. He truly is the ruler of the world. 
Some people, when they try to get all the answers about life and fail to find them, get angry with God about what is happening or is not happening in their lives when it's wiser for us, and here I think the preacher king can really help us to admit that we are finite beings with fallen minds who cannot understand everything that happens, but we can still worship the God who does know. I wonder what things you're struggling to understand about life, about what's happening in your life, what's happening in the world at this moment. This too is a moment when we can lift our hearts in praise to God as the Apostle Paul did when he confessed his faith in God even in the face of great mystery. He said, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? But the apostle, even though he can't figure it all out and doesn't understand, still wants to say that from God and to him and through him are all things. To him be the glory forever. We are invited to rest content with our limitations and worship God for his superior wisdom. I love the way Isaac Watts describes this in one of his hymns, not so well known to us, but it's a beautiful line. This might, maybe this is a, a, one of the new hymns that the Gillies can introduce. Where reason fails with all her powers, there faith prevails and love adores. It's a posture of surrender and reverence and worship and affection for the God who rules. Well, as the preacher king wrestled with the ways of God, not yet reaching the place of adoring love, his faith did prevail and he found himself, this is the second main thing I want to point out here, he found himself in the Father's hands. Despite his philosopher's frustrations, he found himself in the Father's hands. Notice how in the opening verses of chapter 9, he affirms his belief in the sovereignty of God even though he is still wrestling with some of its practical implications. Notice verse 1, all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. And here we see the preacher leaving God's people in God's hands, God's hand. It's a biblical figure for God's power and love and his supervision and his, his guidance. And here it expresses his sovereign supervision of what is happening in the world. God really does have the whole world in his hands. There's a beautiful illustration of this on Wheaton's campus. It's a sculpture called In God's Hands. And it's two large hands holding a pretty much life-size baby boy. It's an expression in bronze of the sovereignty of God. And especially if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this image of the hand is an image of amazing comfort and assurance because we know that the hand of God towards us is a hand of love. We also know that the hands of Jesus were pierced to show us that affection. We've been singing about it this morning. He was pierced for our transgressions when they nailed him to the tree. Those are the hands that God has for us, hands of love and, effect, and affection and sacrifice. Now this gives us the hope and faith, I think, to leave things in God's hands. Whatever burdens we're facing in life right now, whatever trials, uncertainties about the future, all of our cares, we have a Savior who loves us and died for us who will also care for us. But now I have to admit that that's not fully yet the preacher's perspective because he hasn't seen life and eternity framed by the cross yet. He's still writing out of his struggle to understand what, God's, what, what God is doing in the world and some of that uncertainty comes out very clearly in the second half of verse 1. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. This is one of the ver verses, one of, not a, not a, there's more than one in Ecclesiastes that are hard to understand. We may not be fully certain 
of the meaning here. I think what the preacher king is saying is that whether God is going to seem for you or against you is uncertain, and we both of those things seem to happen in the world. It's love and hate here in the sense we find it in Romans chapter 9. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Hate and love here is whether God is offering you blessing or in the particular circumstance rejection. And the problem is it's hard for us sometimes to know from our outward circumstances whether God is for us or against us. That's the way that the preacher feels. That's what he's wrestling with this in, in his moment. He hasn't lost his grip on the sovereignty of God. He believes that God is over it all, and he knows that his fate is in God's hands, but he doesn't have full confidence that God will be for him rather than against him. And the Bible speaks to both of these things. Scripture says God's right hand is filled with righteousness. It says that we are the sheep of his hand. It says that nobody can ever take us out of God's hand, even at the time of death. But the scripture also says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's not enough to know that we're in God's hands. Everyone is. The question is whether God is for us or against us. Is he friend or foe? And as the preacher wrestled with this, and sometimes I suppose we all have our doubts. Yes, we believe in the promises of God, but... The way things are going right now, it feels like God is against you. And what the preacher discovered is you can't figure out whether God is for you or against you simply by your circumstances in life, by looking at the outward situation, because it is not the case, although many people assume that it is, that if you follow God, he's going to give you only blessing, that there will be an earthly reward for your faithfulness. So all you, if that were true, then all you would have to do is just count people's blessings and you'd be able to tell, yeah, that person's under God's favor, that person really is not. But that is not how God operates. And as far as the preacher could tell, all of us face great trials in life and all of us may experience some blessings. And he talks in verses 2 and 3 about how it's the same for all, whether you're righteous or unrighteous, there are some things in the world that happen to everyone. Earlier, the preacher had assured us, this is in chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, that things are going to go well for the righteous, not for the wicked. Certainly that will be true on the day of judgment. But the preacher still struggled to understand why the righteous were not blessed and the wicked were not cursed. Doesn't that surprise you sometimes? You see someone, after all the things that they've done, you feel like, how can they still be experiencing so much blessing in life? And you look at someone else and you don't understand the deep trials that they are going through. Well, the preacher king struggled with that as well. The reason it's so hard to tell just from outward circumstance whether God is for us or against us is because the same things happen to everyone. And you'll notice here how carefully he distinguishes between two kinds of people, the one group. It's good, it's righteous, it's clean. These people are offering sacrifices to God as they should. There's another group that's wicked, evil, unclean. They don't make any sacrifices to God, not surprisingly, given how evil they are. But despite the fact that some of them honor God and others do not, strangely, they suffer the same fate. It's the same for all. The same event happens to all, the heavy storms, the righteous get flooded out with the wicked, the earthquake, they are all shaken by it. If there's an economic downturn, they both go broke. And so we're never going to be able to separate the righteous from the wicked on the basis of what happens in the world, and we won't really be able to tell just from our outward circumstances whether God is for us or not. God sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, this has so many implications. Let me just say that if you've, even, if you've been thinking, ah, maybe God is not, not so pleased with me. Just, just look at the things that are happening in my life. Don't give in to that way of thinking for a moment. That's not the biblical perspective about the sovereignty of God and his love and his righteousness. But this reality of life in a fallen world frustrated the preacher no end. And he was also frustrated by this, just by simply all the evil that he saw in the world around him. This is an evil 
in all that is done under the sun. He says this fact, that both the righteous and the unrighteous suffer, and also, he adds to it at the end of verse 3, the children, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that, they go to the dead. This is why I was so grateful Robin gave me this passage, because of (laughs) just how futile it all seems to be. Aren't you glad that the Bible is honest about all of that and all of those frustrations. You look at the, the evil that's happening in the world today, and it's not just, it's not just uh, Israel and Palestine. It's Tigray, it's Darfur. It's things happening here in the United States. I was with a ministry colleague yesterday. His community is grieving because a 13-year-old shot and killed a 15-year-old. And they are wondering, what, what is happening in this evil world. It's not surprising. It drives some people almost out of their minds. And the worst thing of all is what is at the end of verse 3. After that, they go to the dead. And that certainly is going to happen to everyone, both the righteous and the unrighteous, both those who sacrifice and those who do not. Once again, the preacher king confronts us with our own mortality. This is the final thing I want to point out, what the preacher says about life and death and life after death. Most people try to avoid thinking very much about death. I think Solomon thought about it as often as he could, and that's a good thing, uh, because we need to know what eternity has in store for each one of us, and we need to see our lives in the light of eternity. Now, what do you think about what the preacher says about life and death? He who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. What is true of them forever? End of verse 6, they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Here the preacher king repeats what may have been a memorable proverb. The lion is a noble beast. Everyone knows that. It was the emblem of the house of David, the mighty lion. By contrast, in the biblical world, just set aside your happiness over your Labrador retriever. In the biblical world, dogs did not have a very positive reputation. Typically, they were wild animals. They were scavengers. He's not, the preacher king isn't thinking about a pet here in the royal palace. He's talking about the kind of dog that might roam the streets. It's like the expression Goliath gave when he wanted to taunt the boy David. He said, am I a dog that you come after me with sticks? Most of the dog references in the Bible are not positive ones. And even the most ardent dog lover, I think, would have to admit that dogs are not lions with their, with their mighty bearing. And in fact, if you think about it, you can't really imagine insulting anyone by calling them a lion. If somebody had tried to insult you that way, you'd say, yes, thank you, I, I am a lion. But if somebody called you a dog, you might not appreciate it. But the situation changes if the lion is dead. Then the dog is clearly on top because at least he is living, and living surely is better than dying. And here the preacher mentions some of the problems with death. When you're dead, you don't know anything about what's going on. That's a problem, nothing nothing about anything happening on earth anyway. And the preacher here, I I think, is not denying the afterlife. It's evident in verse 6 he does believe in a life to come, but he is describing the totally permanent end that death brings to earthly existence. It's at that moment that we forfeit our share to anything that is done under the sun. The dead, he says, don't gain any earthly reward. Dead, the death brings them into oblivion. People don't even remember who they were eventually. Even the emotions that make people feel alive, love and hatred and envy, the things that make you feel really alive, all of that disappears when you die. And when you Consider the things that you lose through death, 
That ought to make you pretty happy that you are still living, experiencing the, the, even the little joys of life on this beautiful planet. It, however difficult life may be, it is better than the alternative. That's the point that the preacher king is trying to make. Where there's life, there's hope. But how much hope is there really? Now, preacher, is, preacher King is like this. Surely you've experienced this as you've gone through Ecclesiastes. You just get to a point where you're feeling a little bit encouraged, and then he pulls the rug right out from under you again. Here in verse 4, he refers to hope. What's the hope in verse 5? The living, here's the hope, wait for it, know that they will die. Now, that may not seem like much of a hope. It's small comfort. Although, I think when you look at the big picture of Ecclesiastes, the author is trying to give you, the Holy Spirit is trying to give you a sober-minded approach to life that will be rugged enough for the kind of world that we actually live in. And if death is coming, aren't you glad you know that it is? Surely it is, in one sense, better to be alive than dead. And perhaps... Good for us to know that death is coming so that we can prepare for it. I want to admit, this is one of the most pessimistic passages in Ecclesiastes. Reminded of a story I once read about a medical student that came to the British preacher and evangelist David Watson, and he was deeply troubled because as a medical student, he had encountered his first cadaver. And as he had gone through the dissection, he was deeply shaken cutting through muscle and tissue and saying to himself, if this is all we become at death, what is the point of anything? Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes doesn't give us the full answer to that question, either in this passage or probably even by the end of the book. But I can't leave you here this morning not knowing (laughs) the answer to that question. And you have to look beyond this chapter, partly to the end of the book, because you do get some help by the time you get to the end of Ecclesiastes. Here we are in chapter 9, we're life under the sun. Every now and then there's a little hint that there might be a different life, a life that is above the sun. And certainly by the time we get to chapter 12, not to, not to steal Robin Cho's thunder, but we will learn that the spirit returns to God who gave it. There is a life to come. And God is going to bring things to judgment, and that's good news because of all the evil in this world. There is hope coming in the reality, in in the face of death by the time you get to the end of Ecclesiastes. But you've got to read beyond Ecclesiastes to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the promise of the resurrection. Sometimes the Bible helps us by giving questions that we can't understand in the moment. And sometimes life helps us by giving us questions we can't answer in the moment. But if we stay with the questions and learn how to trust God through the process, eventually we get to the place where he satisfies our souls. And I'll just say again, this isn't really the kind of book that you keep reading until you get the answer, but the kind of book that helps you know how to serve God and worship him when you don't have all the answers. And it's part of a bigger book, the full Bible, that gives fuller answers to some of the questions that Ecclesiastes only begins to address keep reading. I was thinking on on our way here of a story I heard a year or two ago. A few of you um, may know the story, the children's story, the tale of Despero. I wouldn't think of that as a particularly scary book. I mean, it's about mice and all that. But there was a little boy who was really troubled and told his mother to stop reading because the book was too scary for him. And amazingly, when they went to the grocery store that morning, they ran into Kate DiCamillo, who's the author of the book. And they had a conversation with her. And afterwards, the little boy said, and Kate DiCamillo put this on her uh, website, um, a little boy said to his mother, you know, maybe we can go back and finish the book. He still didn't know the ending, but he had met the author. And her character and her affection and how she engaged with him and how she treated him, just even in that brief conversation, that was enough for him to know, I can trust this author. I'm willing to hang with this author until I see the end of the story. 
And Ecclesiastes is giving us enough of the character and person of God to keep reading through the Bible, see this story, see this experience, see this exploration in the context of the entire Bible. And what does the rest of the Bible teach us about the life to come? It teaches that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has gone ahead of us into glory. And we were singing about that this morning as, as well. Yes, the Son of God framed on the cross in expectation of his ascension to glory. First, giving his life away, entering into death and all of the futility of life on this fallen, in this fallen world. And you just get little glimpses. I mean, Jesus himself was frustrated, frustrated and, and angry in the face of death and evil in the world. All the things that the preacher king went through in Ecclesiastes, Jesus experienced them in his experience of life in this fallen world. And at the end of that, what Ecclesiastes says about everyone was true of him. He died and he was buried in the ground, as dead as dead could be. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, rising to immortality, bringing life out of the deadly grave, and the promise of God for every believer in Christ is that you will live. You will not end your life in this despairing way, but death will be for you as a follower of Christ, the risen one, your entranceway to glory. You go all the way to the end of the Bible and read to the very end of the story in the book of Revelation. The Bible says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. We will rest from all our weary labors, all the sleepless nights, all of that, the earthly toil, everything that Ecclesiastes testifies to. We will rest from all of that, entering into the presence of God, knowing the fullness of his joy. Our physical bodies will rise again. They will not be lost to the dust the scripture says that we will be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. What hope these promises bring to life and what confidence they can give to face the struggles of life but also to prepare for the day of death. I close by inviting you to consider the dying words of the infamous Giacomo Casanova, who like the preacher king in Ecclesiastes, had tasted almost everything that life has to offer, including many sinful pleasures. We know this from his writings. And we know that none of those experiences satisfied his soul. But multiple witnesses testify that his dying words expre expressed hope in resurrection life. I have lived as a philosopher and die as a Christian. It's a good way of framing the book of Ecclesiastes. Enter into all of these frustrations, live as a philosopher, so to speak, wrestling with the struggles of life. If you try the experiments that the preacher king tried, it's only gonna end in dissatisfaction. I can save you the trouble right now. All of that is part of living as a philosopher. Will you die as a Christian? That's the eternal question. Will you die trusting in the Lord and giver of life, entrusting your life into his hands and entering into the joy that he has promised to give. Father, we give you thanks for the sober reality of Ecclesiastes. Lord, we give you thanks that in the Bible there are so many places that testify to the sorrows and trials of our own lives, the questions we have, we thank you that Jesus of Nazareth entered in and as the Son of God suffered the travails of this life. And Lord, we give you praise for the message of the cross and the empty tomb, which is for us the hope of eternal life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our service with a hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Please stand.
tis manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest. Dear name the rock on which I built my shield and hiding place, my never failing treasury filled with boundless stores of Priest and King, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the grace I bring. With this the effort of my heart and hold my warmest thought. But when I see thee as thou art, I'll praise. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.